Okay, ladies, time is up. I hope you learned something about uh, each other that you didn't know. I know I learned a few things about the ladies at my table I didn't know. So that's good. Okay, now it's time to swap babies, and it's Sarah's time to come, and she's going to give us her testimony. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, I have a crutch. You would think I wouldn't need to write down about my life. You would think I'd know my own story. Um, but I would get sidetracked if I didn't put down what I wanted to share with you, because I get really nervous talking in front of groups. So it's a stretch for me. Um, first of all, I'll introduce myself. My name is Sarah Anderson. Some of you might have known me as Sarah Roser, uh, or gone to camp with me. I see you taking my picture. You are not my friend right now. <laughs> um, I'm Cheryl and Bruce Roser's daughter. I went to um, what was Berean Bible Church and is now Graceway um, Church, just Graceway Church, right? In Edgewater um, as, as a kid and as a teenager. So you may know me from there. You may not know me at all. Um, when Miss Deborah asked me to give my testimony, a couple thoughts went through my head. I, at first I was like, why me? I'm nobody special. Uh, what could I have to share? Wouldn't it be better if an older, wiser, more knowledgeable of the scriptures woman gave their testimony than, than me? Um, and then the third thing that went through my mind was, no way speaking in front of crowds makes me nervous. I think I'm gonna have to shave my legs when I go home because I got <laughs> goosebumps. <laughs> Um, but the more I thought and prayed about it, uh, her requests, um, my thinking began to change. I was correct in that I'm not anyone particularly special, uh, but I am special to God, and he may use my story to help encourage somebody else, uh, and who am I to deny him of my story? Uh, an older, wiser woman may indeed and has shared their stories, um, but maybe my story is meant to reach or impact somebody that your story doesn't. Uh, speaking in front of crowds does make me nervous, but if I let everything that made me uncomfortable keep me from stepping outside of my comfort zone, then Satan wins. He wins because we'd never grow if we didn't try new things, and we may never reach who we're supposed to be as an ambassador for Christ uh, if we don't grow. So, here I am, now that I put all my selfish fears and nerves aside, hopefully I'm a little bit calmer, and um, I can share my story with you. And my story started when I was about three years old. I remember sitting on my bed and um, my parents teaching me that no matter how hard I tried to be a good little girl, uh, there would always be some bad in me. It wasn't my fault, it was just something that we're all born with. Uh, Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. They said that the God who created me is so good that he cannot allow any bad things into heaven with him. Uh, then they taught me that the same great God who made me loved me so much that he wanted me to be good. But since I couldn't do it on my own, he sent Jesus, the only son he ever had, to die for me so his goodness could be given to me. So when God looked at me, he would see his son Jesus and he would let me into heaven. All I had to do was accept the goodness from Jesus, and I was good to go. It was a present from God to me. Um, at that time in my life, it was simple. God was giving me a present, and what little girl doesn't love presents? Later on, my parents learned the concept of right division and how the whole Bible is written for us to learn from, but not all of it is written to us. They taught me these truths as they learned them, and going to Brain Bible Church and Graceway, I learned this whole thing and still am learning it. Um, and as I learned that, I believed what they were teaching me unwaveringly. They were my parents, this is what they said. And I, I believed it so strongly that when somebody else wouldn't understand it, I would cry. I remember having a friend at, at Grace Camp and we would give her the gospel multiple different ways that week and she still just didn't get it. And I was so sad that she was going to hell. I just couldn't understand how she couldn't accept this free gift uh, and let's see I went to door to door with the teenagers at Berean Bible Church and gave the gospel and did all these other 
other good things that Christian girls do. And then once I reached my teenage years and started working and taking college courses, I began to question why I believed the things my parents taught me. I discovered that I believed them because I trusted my parents. But at, every teenager learns their parents don't know anything. Um, and we should probably not trust them at all. After all, I was 16 and had gained all the experience and knowledge needed to navigate through life. So I really didn't need my parents. Um, as I sorted through these things in my mind, I wondered about whether God was even real. I questioned whether he was there. And what if I just behaved like the other kids my age instead of always being Miss Goody Two-Shoes and going to teen class and door-to-door -door and things like that? And what about the other side? If there was a God, what did Satan have to offer? Uh, it took me some time, but eventually I did sort through the questions. Uh, I believe a big part of it was how open my parents were with me as I questioned these things. Um, they let me make my own decisions about why I believe what I believe. I determined that God is real because someone had to create all the amazing, intricate details that make up our world. Can't look at a flower or a butterfly or the human body and not believe that somebody created it. It didn't just happen. Uh, I did try the things of the world, drinking, drugs, sex before marriage, all the things the Bible tells you not to do. I gave them a try, and it left me feeling guilty and unfulfilled. I learned that God tells us these things to avoid those things, not to be a tyrant, um, but to protect us from the guilt and pain that they cause. And while, yes, Satan can present what he has to offer in a fun and exciting, exciting way, um, he does this to serve his own gain and, and not to prosper us. I now believe that everybody takes this journey in their own way at different ages, different stages in life. At some point in life, we all have to decide what we believe and why we believe it. And the journey of how we get to those answers and understanding is what God uses, if we let him, nerves and all, um, to reach all different types of people with the message of his love and forgiveness. As Paul says in Ephesians 3, 8 and 9, he says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So if Paul could do it, the person that was killing the saints, then who am I to not get up and share my story that God has given me? Um, so I hope you're encouraged by what I had to share. If you know somebody that needs to talk or needs prayer is going through some of the same things, I'd be happy to talk with them if they want somebody to talk to. So thank you. Okay, Deborah, come on now. We're ready for session four. Oh, thank you. Well, that, that uh, testimony especially touches me as my daughter is 20 and she now is at that same stage where I know nothing, she has learned everything. So um, it's a hard place, but it's a story and it's definitely needed. It's needed to be told and uh, people go through it. I went through it too, 10 years, 10 years. Okay, well, wow, this is the last session. I can't believe how fast this went. Um, we're gonna try to catch up from last time <clears throat> and finish up. Um, I just wanna say thank you, be, unless I forget at the end, Fellowship Bible Church for having us for this wondrous opportunity to have fellowship around the word and for all the people that participated, and that's everybody, you all participated in your own way. I'm so excited. This is to me what a retreat is, and I'm thanking you for coming. Okay, um, we're gonna just finish up Ephesians and some things in Ephesians that, I, that prompted some, some thoughts on other verses. Um, Ephesians is very weighty, 
and there's a lot in there, but it's very instructive. Even if you can just read the surface of it, it's clear that it provides some direction in relationships. Um, we didn't get to chapter six, but of course we talked about it. I put down some of the additional provisions that at the end there, knowing his will, knowing our, our great um, position as Gentiles now, knowing our vocation, knowing our, our, our roles, and the armor of God in chapter six. And while we didn't go through chapter six, it's a major provision because we can think differently. It's our mind that God wants, and we can put it on like a piece of clothing and remember that we have all power with God in us. We can do anything. And so whatever the, the challenge is, we've got, he's got us covered. So some of the additional things that stirred up in my heart to bring up is we talked about Romans 5, that tribulation cycle or process. Patience worth experience, experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. Very important to understand that all these problems work for you, in particular, personally, as you're going through it. The Holy Spirit takes the word, and he, he squeezes that doctrine, and it, it, it forms even more fully in you, enabling you to live it out. I don't know how to explain it exactly, but it really, you put, it's, it's put up or shut up. You either believe it or you don't. Um, I, there was a time in my life when my ex-husband is like, he was saying, do this. It was all illegal things. It's like, I can't do this. You're supposed to submit. It's like, so I don't submit and do evil things. But don't submit. Either way, I was going to do something wrong, it seemed. I was a very young Christian. It was very hard, but it was like, do I believe God or not? Do I believe in his goodness? I've got to stay focused. And it was a very challenging from the beginning of being a, a Christian, I think, and yet it worked for me. So whatever challenges you're going through, it's glory. It's glory working in you. Even if you can't see it, trust it. God's got you covered. So Romans 5, that's important. Uh, Hebrews 5, let's go there. Of course, Hebrew, Hebrews is out of Paul's epistles, but it's still, there's still teaching in Hebrews that can be helpful. Um, while he's writing to the Hebrews, um, he's writing about the growth process. The growth process is the same as far as I've seen it. And we're going to pick it up, <clears throat> uh, uh, Hebrews 5, um, verse 11. It says, of whom we have many things to say and are hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. It's a rebuke. Who he's speaking with, these Jews, they are still babes. They're not growing. Does it sound familiar? It sounds like 1 Corinthians to me. And sure, um, they're not growing. So what does he say? Verse 12, for when for a time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. Well, of course, that's specific to Israel. But we have some, that's what Paul said to the Galatians. He had to form Christ in them again. And so... It's very related. It says, are ye become such as need of milk and not of strong meat? That's what he said in 1 Corinthians 3. The Corinthians were babes, carnal babes. They needed milk because they couldn't bear the strong meat. What is milk? It's, yeah, baby food, exactly. It's baby food. What's strong meat? adult and it's more weighty doctrine you know if you're a babe you're really stuck it's not up there now but in the beginning of romans in the very beginning if you're a babe and you're not applying the scriptures you don't know it well enough it's all up here if you have it and not here so they couldn't bear it the hebrews either verse 13 for everyone that useth milk 
is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Now this is the part that really helped me to see things. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You have to exercise the doctrine. You have to do that. I think it's important. Um, the next verse I want to go over, it's just a bunch of verses that I thought might be helpful to finish this section up. Philippians 2, 12 to 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in mine absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's, it's speaking to the Philippians here. Philippians were built up saints. They had formed a lot of the doctrine in them. It's after Ephesians, so it's a church that's more built up and they are applying the Ephesians doctrine and going onward. But he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, aren't they saved? They're saved. It's, that's not what it's talking about. What does it mean to work out your own salvation? Somebody? Yeah. That's right. You're working it out, and it's with fear and trembling. It's not easy. You're walking that walk of faith, and your flesh is, is against you. <laughs> it's the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. It's a battle. It's the war. It's the battle of the mind. That's where it is. It's, it's Romans 7. And so it says, work it out. Verse 13, 4. That's important, that word for. For it is God which worketh in you. It's not you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You've got to will it. It's got to be a part of your will, your desire. It's free choice. Renew your mind. Get your word here. Think about it. It goes to your heart, and you really know it. And it becomes a part of your will. You're forming the mind of Christ. You've got his mind. And then you do his good pleasure. If you do it any other way, it's your flesh. It's the only way. It's God's way. Questions? I know this is probably something you already know, these things. But I just thought they would be good admonitions. First Timothy 4. Of course, 1 Timothy is Paul speaking to his beloved son, Timothy. He's a leader. He's the one that's taking over for Paul as Paul um, goes off the scene and is, is killed, martyred. And he's timid. He's fearful, crying even. And Paul is giving him instructions, things that people in leadership positions, especially within the church, run across. And anyone who's leading people can learn from this. Um, we're in, two, uh, let's see, 4, verses 6 through 10. 1 If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. You see that same thing is, it's milk, Versus meat, nourishing up. You've got to feed your little inner man. It's growing. It's a baby, and it grows up to an adult believer. And you have to nourish it up. He's even saying that to a leader of the church. Um, and it says, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. That, that goes back to Philippians 3 again. Walk as what you've attained unto. Um, verse 7. But refuse profane and old wives' fables. Exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little. But godliness is profitable unto all things. Having the promise of life that now is. 
and of that which is to come. There's fruit here on this earth, but also on into eternity. Get a handle on that. First Corinthians 3, there is a sowing and reaping. And it's really, you reap much more bountifully than what you sow. When you, even with a seed, you sow a few seeds and all these plants come up, it's the same thing. You've, like a tree, it has a million pieces of fruit, apples, tons of them, year after year after year, but one little seed. That's what God wants. We want, he wants us, that seed of faith, to grow in us. And it's exercise, not physical exercise, living for our flesh and our fleshly needs. Oh, we got lots of needs and lots of things we've got around us to do all the time. It takes up our time. But what really counts is the spiritual exercise here. Much could be said, but um, I think we'll stop there. Um, it's a faith walk, and it's really why God's in us. It's we yield, and God does the work. He does it because he doesn't want us to be alone, and he wants us to have success. If he, if he didn't go in us, it would be the fruits of the flesh. It would burn away. He has thought about it ahead, and he designed it perfectly. It's all about him and Christ. So it's important just to focus on your own self, not your problems, but rather your identity in Christ, and then your, your corporate identity. Build up, take the time to do it, and then see how you can minister. How can you be used? Um, even, a, even just presenting the gospel at, you know, in your, your um, testimony, it can have an effect that redounds to the glory of God, the ripple effect, as I, I call it. Um, any questions about that? Anything that anyone else sees is a key thing we might have missed this, mor this morning? There's so much. We couldn't hit it all. Okay. We have until what, four, Sue? Okay. Now we're actually on sessions four. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Um, let's go to your packet, and it's... Um, I believe it's the last, um, it's the last one, if I can find it, oh well. Yeah, it's the, it's the timeline, I, yeah, wow, I lost it, hmm. okay. Here it is. Um, I added this because it's the way I think, and I see it as an imperative to understand how is the book of Romans set up, and how can you use it on a timeline, if you can put yourself on this timeline, all the way to the left. Does everybody have it? Okay. All the way to the left is you're starting your journey before you're a believer, and once you, you start to be a believer, really Romans 1 through 4, coming to an understanding and the meaning of the cross work, understanding your sin, Romans 1, understanding God's judgment, understanding the gospel of Christ, the basics of it, that Christ died, was buried, and rose again, and that when he rose, that was life, and that life is given to us. We are closely identified with that death, burial, and resurrection. In Romans 6, it talks about that. Anyway, we believe that. Just sit in faith. That's all we do. Romans 4, that's what 4 is, all about faith and how you get imputed righteousness just by faith alone, doing nothing, believing God, and believing he did it all. If you, if you understand that, you move to the next section, and that's being secure in Christ. Romans 5.1, 
You understand that you have a great standing. You have peace with God. You've got some things. And he goes on to say, now that you're saved, much more is God able to give you in chapter 5. Much more is, is a, a phrase that's used over and over because we have much more grace from God now that we're saved. And so from, from this point onward, he's speaking, like I said yes, or earlier today, he's speaking to believers. And in 6, 7, and 8, it's your, about your identity. And if you don't understand your identity, how to access the power of God, how not to be to put under the law and put yourself under the law, and um, h- how to mortify the deeds of your body, Well, that's in chapter 8 there. If you don't understand these basic things, that's where you are. That's where you should study more and think about it. And then 9 through 11, it's understanding where you fit in, the timeline, and God's overall plan and purpose with Israel, but also with us. And we, you know what? We have a short little window. The body of Christ could be gone later today, right this moment as we're talking. So we have a window where some of us are older on the older side of the, the lifeline and we might have another 30 or 40 years, but we might not. We don't even know how are we going to use this ending part. This is the most important. And so it's because once, once people no longer you know, respond to the gospel, once no one else is being put into the body of Christ, as I understand it in Romans 11, the end of the uh, body of Christ happens. We're taken out of here, and Israel's program starts again. And so what are you going to do? Ask yourself, what are you going to do from now until the time you have left? Um, chapter 12, we've been talking about it. It's really your ministry, and it's how you can serve and worship God. 13, it's understanding authority in grace and how, what it looks like. And really, we didn't talk about it, but it really teaches you about a new, a new way, the grace way. 14 and 15, it's about what does grace look like in the local assembly. How do you deal with the weaker brother in grace? If you force them to believe what you think is right, even if it is rightly dividing, I know it's true, but if you force them to believe it, if you pound them and you you make them feel like they are lesser, that they're dumb, that they're wrong, if they, they are wrong, but they need to process through it. Patience, love, kindness, give them time. It might take them four years. It might take them 10 years. God gives them grace. Give them grace. That's what chapter, chapter 14 and 15 is about. How did God's their judge, not you. If you force someone to believe what you believe, guess what? You've become their tutor and governor. Now you, they're coming to you instead of the word. You've become their God. <laughs> That's hard to say, but it's true. Point them to the word. Help them along. Be a helper of their joy. But don't coerce. Grace people can sometimes be so legalistic. (laughs) And that is one way when you force people. You and I did never even thought of that before, but it's true. We have to be careful, even especially with babes Um, and people that differ in what they believe. It takes time. How long did it take us to come to this? A while. And the last one, 16, it's what it looks like. We're a helper working along with Paul and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what chapter 16 is about. So how can you use this? Wow. Well, I'll ask you. Let's, let's think it out. If someone has no clue about the gospel, in the book of Romans, where would you take them? One through four. It's clear. Help go through it with them. Tell them where to read and study. What happens if they aren't real sure about their security? They think they're going to lose their salvation. Where would, you, where would you put them? I'm sorry, someone has to speak louder. I can't hear. 
five. Yeah, and they probably don't understand one through four all that well either. So, but they're not, they haven't gotten to five, obviously. So you know that. And same with you. If you're at a point where you're not really sure about your salvation, confident, absolute, one through five, focus yourself on that. How about, and I'm going to go out of order this time so you can't cheat. <laughs> um, what happens if people have been saved a long time? They obviously understand who they are in Christ, but they don't serve. They don't do anything. Where would you take them? Romans 12, and probably they haven't gotten that concept, that agape love, the selfless love, maybe 9, 10, and 11 too right? And how about this? How about if people are, um, people are, um, let me see, having problems with putting themselves under the law. They're so, so, so much condemnation. They're, they're speaking against themselves. It's all negative. They speak, they speak negative about other people. Where are they? Romans 6 and 7, and because they haven't learned that they're dead to the flesh, dead to the law, and um, what's the other one? Dead to sin, verse 6, 7, and 8. They, they really haven't learned that. They might know it here. They haven't learned it here. And so encourage them, help them. So, and it's, it's all also about you because we are on this continuum. And I, you could do the same continuum with Romans through Philemon. I just didn't do it today. It would have been too much for, for today. Um, any questions about that? Yeah. We do. And you know, you start as a babe. I didn't, I didn't really talk. That's right. You do bounce back and forth. And sometimes you stay in the same place for 30 years. Some people might get saved and stay in, in the very beginning. They all, in fact, a lot of um, people in churches, they stay there, they think, oh, I got saved, that's it. They don't even know about growing. They have no clue that they're supposed to grow. So they should be encouraged if you see someone. Same thing with people who are rightly dividers. I've seen it. They, get, they understand rightly dividing. Okay, finally, I got there. I got it. And it is a key, but it's just a key. It opens the door, and now you need to push through it. There's tons more. There's tons more. So we get stuck in certain spots, and sometimes we regress if we stay out of the word. Um, the other thing is, this is just like a child growing up to adulthood. There's a time for a babe. There's an adolescent period where you think you know it all and you just won't trust God. But when you get to Romans 8 and you're led by the Spirit, you step up from being a know-it-all and you think, nope, I need to yield to God and let him lead. Lead me where he, where he needs me to go. And so the end is adulthood. Any, any other questions? That was a good question, Cheryl. I don't know if it's helpful to you. Does this seem like logical or does it seem helpful? I, you know, I've never heard anybody talk on it, but it just came out of here, so I thought, well, maybe it wouldn't be too helpful, but maybe it would. It helped me. Okay. Um, we're transitioning now, and we're transitioning from... Um, you know, Ephesians and basic things that we've been talking about into study, study tools. And the reason why I did that is, well, why would I do that? Why would I end with study tools and study suggestions? The more you know about how the Bible's laid out, the more you know about study tools and reading and how to do it where it, it's impacting you personally, the more you're likely to do it. And it's self-motivating. Once you get going, wow, God takes you. He does the work. He pulls you along, but you got to do it. And so 
I never had any study tools. I grievously, I'm, I'm not a reader. I hated to read. And so the thought that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, it was like, oh, wow, this is a big one. And I prayed a year before I could read the Bible. I, uh, really, a year. And, but he, he did it. It was miraculous, I, I have to say. I haven't stopped reading it since then. Reading is the best place to start. Um, what is reading? Do you know what the word means? Anybody? It's a simple word. We all know it. What is That's right. Taking information in with your eyes. What else? Uh, assimilating it, understanding it. That's right. You process what the, the, the little letters, the words, the sentences to make some sense out of it. That's right. It says in the dictionary, let me read it. It says, um, to discover, inspect, understand words, fully know, to give sense to something. Um, we can sometimes just get facts and figures. That's head knowledge. We want it to go here, so you have to, with reading, what, what do you have to add to reading? Well, faith and understanding, meditation, you got to think about it. You got to think about it. And even if it's informally through the day, you just think, that's why I start the day with reading, because then through the day, I think about it. I can't even help but think about it. And that's a good way. You have to find your own way. Yeah. Mm hmm. That's right. It, it's faith comes by hearing. It's really hearing the word and making sense out of it. That, so you're absolutely right. That's right. And there's, there's the body of Christ that can talk to someone who is handicapped or older and has really lost the ability. You can work, walk with him. My dad's 91. He's having a hard time processing information. Uh, he goes, I hear it, but I don't understand it. <laughs> so, you know, I just try to talk to him through the day. That's really, he's not at the point where he can come to a Bible study anymore. He doesn't do that. So I talk incidentally to him about things. Okay, how about study? What does study mean? Study plus meditation? Well, how is it different than reading? It's all encompassed in that. The study is breaking it down. You do that through meditating, through reading, through word search. Um, word searches, yeah. breaking it down, looking at the detail. What, what was said over here? It says learn so that you learn it. That's right, learn it. Go ahead. You can read something and not learn it at all. That's right. Yeah, prayer is exceedingly helpful. A lot of people that I talk to, they don't know how prayer works. They're maybe stuck. They haven't prayed for years. They really don't know how to pray. Romans 8 says the Spirit makes intercession because you know not how to pray as you ought. If that's where you are, just pray anyway. Pray. You pray about everything. If you study, study out prayer, if, that's, if you're not doing it, prayer, it is a big part of the Christian life, and especially about understanding the scripture. Did someone say something? Okay. Um, what is study? I looked that up too. It says, set your mind and thoughts on a subject, apply yourself to context, fix your mind closely, and consider things attentively. Um, very important. What are some methods of study that you know that's been very helpful to you? Yeah. 
before I even opened my Bible. And I found out, I mean, first of all, early in the morning seemed to help me more before people are stirring and cars and running and all the noise. And then in the Old Testament, it, it said, He that searches him early, shall seeks him early, shall find him. And I, I believe that. And the first thing I do when I get up early in the morning, maybe three, four o'clock, I pray and ask God to help me understand and give me wisdom and knowledge and understand. I never open my Bible in the morning like that unless I pray first. And then I learn that studying isn't just reading, but it's repetition over and over and over again. And every time I read that, I see something that I didn't see the time that you did for well, you know, when, when I first started going to that uh, one Bible study and I got saved there, I got, became a believer, um, he just said, I said, what, so what should I read now that I understand faith comes by hearing? He goes, read Romans 1 through 3 over and over. I read, one, I wrote, read Romans 1 and then 1 and 2 and 1. I didn't understand one word of it. It's like, am I stupid? I, I, I thought, I'll just keep reading it. Faith comes by hearing. And I kept reading it. I thought, I don't understand what it's talking about. The older English, there was just so many things, terms. And I did get discouraged, but then I started to think. And I think it was the Spirit, you know, stirring up in me. It's like, God says it, you just do it. Don't understand it, just do it. And you know what? It's a walk of faith. And slowly, ever slowly, I started to understand it. Study, study methods, though. I was thinking of study methods. You're, you're in the Word. How do you study? Yeah. Um, I usually go chapter by chapter in a book, and I'll read the book through a couple of times, and then I read through the chapter. But I like to read out loud because if I'm but reading out loud, I catch things that I didn't see before as I was reading through Okay, stop for just a second, because I have to repeat that. So, uh, my memory's short. Um, what you do is you read through the Bible, or read through the, the, ch the book that you're, you know, and then you go back to the chapter, and you read it over and over again. Is that right? Okay. Okay, stop for a second. So you, you talk out loud, and you, you basically are seeing what a key verse. They're, each chapter has a key verse in it. So you can look for a key verse. Everybody will see something different depending on where you are. Yeah. Go ahead and keep going. And And that's right, breaking it up into sections. It's just like outlining. It's not that hard, really, and you will outline it differently. I wrote that book, and I outlined it, and when I planned this, I was outlining it different. I thought, is this okay? It is okay. It is where you are at the time. It's just a helping tool. Someone else will do it different than you, so it's not in stone. It's just a helping tool, okay, Robin? Okay, so there's depth to the scripture. Yeah. So when you go through it, just because you didn't get it, 
doesn't mean you shouldn't try again, but give yourself some time and, and loop back and come back through it again because you'll see another level. You, you have a maturing process. Everybody's different. You'll pick up what you can in a Bible study. If you, let's say you take that Roman study and you go through together, you all come away with something a little different and that's okay. And so come back through it and use it again or something else. Just read and God will take you through it. You don't need that Roman study, but if you're intimidated, if you've never studied, it might be helpful to help to get started, and it asks a lot of questions. And so the layering, it's an eternal layering. You're never gonna finish. So. And there are key word, words in, a, in your film too. When I'm reading, there's some words stand out as words. I mean, yeah. key words, like also of, therefore, and all of these, some words just let you know one connects to the other, and some just give it like in, what we were talking about. Some of those words just stand out. And there are helping words. I call them helping words because then there's key words which are repeated words through the thing, like no, know, knowing, that type of thing. So two separate things. These kind of things are very helpful, and if you just read, you'll start noticing them. And then it'll be interesting. It's like, wow, we used this so many times. I better look this word up. <laughs> and then you'll expand your understanding. Every time you'll notice, go with your, I know this sounds weird, but go with your feelings. Go with what's interesting to you. It really works. You get motivated that way. Okay. Um, yes. Sometimes How? A partner helps you to study. Accountability for one thing. Um, seeing you from a different perspective for another thing. That's right. It 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 really helps to fill in the gaps and he keeps you accountable, a friend or a Bible study group. What's that? Not legalistically, but That's right. And open your open your horizons just because you guys are far apart the different churches. I do maybe six or seven Bible studies over the phone. Skype, hey, there's lots of opportunities. You're not on an island anymore, you know. There are some good things to the electronics. Um, okay, how about some other, let me just list some ideas, verse by verse study. Um, you can do topical studies. You can do um, word studies. You can do dis you can study it dispensationally. You can study prayer today and then prayer in the past and prayer in the future. You can let me just see what else. Um, Historically, you can try to get some historical information on something or do a character study on someone that's brought up a lot, really often that you want to learn from. Um, th I, this is not exhaustive, believe me. You can um, read and just think with a particular focus, like I'm going to read this time to see how I can apply this to me how I'm not applying it, how I am applying it. So you can read for application. I have a friend, I never ever heard of anybody reading for application. I don't know where I was. She, 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 I did Bible study with her. She didn't really know very much, but she, she reads for application. What a novel idea. <laughs> wow. Um, let's see what else. Um, I, I guess that's good enough. Uh, the other thing is meditation. What is meditation? We talk about meditation. Do you know what it is? What is it? Thinking on what you read and studied. Thinking on what you read and studied. Okay, that's right. What's going on when you're thinking on it? How do you apply it? How, how to apply it? Anything else? The connections, there's connections that happen. Also, let me give you the definition. I thought this was great. Oh, I love the terminology here. It says, you're dwelling in thought. Let the word of 
Christ dwell in you richly? Dwell, this word dwell, let it live in you. Dwell in thought, contemplate, study, turn or revolve the subject in your mind. Kind of like a diamond. You're turning it around and you're thinking of it in different angles. It's very important. Um, the last thing is exercising the doctrine. How do you exercise the doctrine? What does it even mean? Exercise thyself unto godliness. God, uh, let's see, godly exercise profiteth much. Or, but thank you, thank you. It's you know, it's getting late. <laughs> thank you. That's right. You need to rightly divide and understand where you are. Context of all the things in study. Reading and context. Who's it talking about? Whether it's in the Old Testament or if it's in Paul's. Where are we in the edification? Is this advanced doctrine? Is this doctrine that's teaching the leadership? And how does it apply to me? Am I, look, am I trying to apply advanced things when I'm really just a babe? It's very important to understand so you don't get frustrated. When I tried to apply Romans 4 and to learn contentment in all things and to rejoice in, even in the difficulties, oh my gosh, I couldn't do it. I thought, am I just not faithful? I just was a baby, that's why. I wanted to rejoice in everything, but I, I wasn't seeing the joy in it, believe me. Okay. Yes, go ahead. What's, what's passive study? Exactly. There, or turn on the tape. You don't do much. You're listening. That's right. How about um, interactive study? What does that look like? Exactly. There's, you know, of course, there's a continuum of with it. You could start just passive, and that's where most of us start. In fact, most of us start with just hearing about the word. They don't even hear the word. Then they might sit in a church and passively listen and go home. The word works. And so they might be motivated to move on in their study and might add a little bit, like getting up in the morning and, by the way, I agree with you, Trudy, as far as um, the Old Testament. All it does is say, get up early in the morning. He talks about himself getting up early and trying to woo Israel back to himself. It, the morning, there's something significant. You know, not that you have to. We are under grace. But there is something about the morning being a good spot. So there's, we're on a continuum. We can all just read and then it can transition into study and using some of the study tools. Um, Proverbs 2. I think this is the process of moving from passive to interactive and how someone starts as a believer. My son, this is, um, pro this is um, Solomon speaking to his son. It says, my son, if thou will receive my words and hide my commandments with thee just receive it look at the action words the verbs they just receive it passive so that verse 2 so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom that's a little different when you incline you're purposing to listen to something um and apply thy heart to understanding. You're deciding something. You're going down that path a little bit more. Verse 3, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding. What is that? Actively, actively praying too. We're, we're crying out for, you know, Israel was to cry out. All we need to do is pray. Ask God to help us Stay focused, and he's lifting up his voice. Um, verse 4, if thou seekest her for, as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasure, seeking and searching, we're talking about really going down that road. Think about the gold rush. People left everything. They left all their worldly goods, even their families sometime, to go seek gold in the gold rush. They left everything. It was the 
only focus. This is the kind of focus. We've got treasure. It says there in chapter 3, verse, wait a minute, verse 14 and 15. For the merchandise of it, that's wisdom, is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain of it better than, or thereof than fine gold. She's more precious than rubies, and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. It's everything. Um, eternal value. So what do you get when you do this? God always gives you something. There's a reaping uh, of process as you're seeking and searching. At verse 5 of chapter 2, then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And that's just the beginning. There's much more in Proverbs. It's all about the word. First nine chapters about the word. It's, it's worth studying. Okay, well, wow. Okay, if there's one thing I did, it is four o'clock. I don't even believe it. Whoa. I, before, before Sue comes over, I just want to say one thing. I want to say thank you, and I hope that you learned something new, a nugget. I pray that you have met somebody new and keep connections going a after this. And could I pray? Sure. Let's pray and close. Thank you, God, for this wonderful time of fellowship around your word. Help us to understand your word. It is life itself. It's more important than the food we eat because it is nourishing our eternal soul and spirit for eternity. It is, it is profitable. Help us to learn from one another. Help us to listen to that spirit within us, stirring up that doctrine. Help us to grow and mature and have goals and move along, rejoicing and be a helper of other people's joy. We thank you for these things, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.